Fred Lyles was born in 1987 and grew up in Pontiac, Michigan. He was described as a social butterfly and was very loved by his many friends and family. He lived in Waterford, Michigan and was a talented singer and choir director at the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church and enjoyed theater and the arts. He lived with his boyfriend of two years, Michael Butler Jr., at the River's Edge apartment complex. However, on January 21st, 2021, Craig would vanish into thin air and was last seen by his boyfriend, Michael. Craig's family would become concerned when he stopped answering calls and replying to messages. He had also become inactive on social media, which was very unusual for him. Investigators would find his phone and eyeglasses in the apartment, two items which he never left home without. His car was also still at the apartment, and Michael was suspiciously seen driving it a week after Craig was last seen. Besides his phone and eyeglasses, it appeared that all signs of Craig had been removed from the apartment as if he didn't exist. Michael has not cooperated and has refused to answer questions regarding Craig's disappearance. Soon after he went missing, many people in the community gathered in the freezing temperatures and snow to search for him. They were eventually able to find one clue, a pair of Timberland boots in the apartment dumpster. It is believed the boots possibly belonged to Michael and appeared to have blood spots on them. The boots were turned over to police, but it is unclear at this time if the boots belonged to Michael or the blood belonged to Craig. The case is open and active and the FBI is now involved. Soon after he went missing, his partner Michael was arrested on a parole violation for previous firearm and burglary charges unrelated to Craig's disappearance. His family and friends remain devastated, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Tanya Renee Styles was known by her loved ones as Renee or Renee Whitehill. She graduated high school in Michigan in 1995 and was described as boisterous, blunt, and funny. As a child, she was in foster care and then adopted at the age of nine by Betty and James Whitehill. She married Jason Stiles, but the couple would divorce in 2009. On December 18, 2010, at the age of 34, she had two children, Nathan and Ayla, from previous relationships and was living with her boyfriend, Scott Cassidy, and a male roommate on Orban Road in Grass Lake Township, Michigan. That evening, the roommate stated he fell asleep on the couch, and when he woke up about an hour later, Renee was gone, but all of her belongings were still there. Extensive searches were conducted, but sadly, Renee wasn't found. Six days later, her boyfriend Scott was charged with auto theft for allegedly stealing a van from the Comtronics Security Company in Jackson, Michigan. Turns out, he was already on probation at the time for drug and weapons-related offenses and also had a 1997 conviction for home invasion. Days later, on December 3rd, he hanged himself in jail, but it's unclear whether his suicide is related to Renee's disappearance. At the time of her disappearance, they were struggling financially, leaving Renee without a cell phone or a car. On the night she went missing, her and Scott were supposedly having an argument, but it is unclear if that is related to her disappearance. Scott left a note in jail that stated he did not kill Renee or know anything about her disappearance, and he loved her and her children. Although Renee wasn't happy with the way things were going in life, her loved one said she would have never abandoned her children. Since her disappearance, her son Nathan has married and has children of his own. Her daughter Ayla, who was eight years old at the time her mother went missing, is an accomplished high school student and participated in a student exchange program in Germany. She has been raised by her father, and many say she looks just like her mom. Her family still seeks answers, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Stephen Earl Kraft II was born January 11, 1989, to Shireel and Stephen Kraft. At the age of 12, he was a sixth grader at Hull Elementary School in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and lived on a dead-end street in the 2100 block of Holly Drive in Benton Harbor. His teachers and classmates described him as a quiet, good student. On February 15, 2001, between 7 and 8 p.m., he was playing with his two dogs less than a block from his home as he often did. Meanwhile, his mother was cooking and he said he would be back soon for dinner. 
When he hadn't returned by the early morning hours, his parents reported him missing. At the time, it was below freezing temperatures and Stephen wasn't wearing a hat or gloves. Upon investigation, his footprints led past an iced over pond near his home to Harbor Haven Ministries on Irving Street, one block south of his home. Two or three days later, his older dog returned home. The following day, his other dog was found near Blue Creek, a mile and a half north of Stephen's home. Authorities searched four miles of Blue Creek, and divers searched the pond behind Harbor Haven Ministries, but didn't find any clues to his whereabouts. Investigators searched another area of woods near his home in November 2002, but found no evidence. His house, along with many others in the neighborhood, was torn down in 2005 and built in its place was a runway buffer for the Southwest Michigan Regional Airport. Since his disappearance, his parents have moved to Hager Township, Michigan, but have both sadly passed away in 2021 from COVID-related complications. His siblings, Eddie and Jody, continue to seek answers about their brother's disappearance, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Mark Stephen Martin was born February 5, 1979, to Carolyn Sue Martin, and they lived in Madison Heights, Michigan. Mark's father, Hempara Sant Harry Kirison, had little contact with him and Carolyn until 1981 when Carolyn filed a paternity suit against him for child support and won. He was ordered to pay $30 a week in child support, but within days, he and Carolyn reconciled despite him having nothing to do with her or Mark before being ordered to pay the child support. He then almost immediately proposed to Carolyn and quickly made plans to move the family to San Antonio, Texas. He claimed he had gotten a job there at Mako Body Shop and wanted them to go with him. On August 31, 1981, her family and friends went to help them pack for their abrupt move to San Antonio. They thought it was strange that the only luggage Harry had was a garment bag and small TV. When questioned, Carolyn said that he told her they would buy all new stuff when they got there and for her to pack light as well. The plan was for them to follow Carolyn's twin brother, Timothy, to Oklahoma where he was moving to look for work and spend a day getting him settled and then he would come visit them in Texas. Harry had told Timothy that he would bring CB radios to install in their vehicles to communicate while traveling. However, the evening before they were supposed to leave, Carolyn stopped at her mother's home in Hazel Park, Michigan, and said that by Harry's request, they needed to leave now without Timothy. She said Harry had planned to take I-75 to Texas instead of the route that was originally planned. After saying goodbye to her mother, she and two-year-old Mark were never seen again. When Timothy called the body shop where Harry was supposed to be going to work and explained the situation, they told him Harry was a crook. Carolyn's family was surprised to learn that Harry was not actually living in Texas, but was still in Michigan. When later questioned by police, Harry brought an attorney and would only say that Carolyn changed her mind within an hour after they left the Detroit area and decided she didn't want to go to Texas. He stated he let her and Mark out of the car on the side of I-75 just north of Toledo, Ohio, with the one and only suitcase they had. He also claimed he gave her $4,000 in cash, and she told him to discard her other belongings, and he says this is the last time he saw her. He said on his way home, he stopped at a Salvation Army drop box and discarded everything Sue had left in the car. Harry said he continued on the way to Texas, but changed his mind and turned back when he had car trouble and returned to Michigan. Since Carolyn and Mark disappeared, Harry has changed his name twice, and he has refused to take a polygraph test. He is now known as Harry Kazarian and remains a person of interest in their disappearances. It is speculated that he made up the story about a job in Texas and killed both Mark and Carolyn to avoid paying $30 a week in child support. As of today, Harry remains free and the case remains unsolved. Robert Allen Dale Jr., or Bob, was born November 3, 1962, to Robert Sr. and Jeanette Dale. Bob worked as a carpenter at Chichuk Construction and was described as a dedicated family man and father to his three sons, Robert, Devin, and Connor. 
Bob was in the Navy and was deployed on the USS Henry B. Wilson as a radio man with top security clearance. On May 18, 1996, at the age of 33, he and his wife Christy attended a wedding reception in the area of Six Mile Road and Mackinac Trail in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Many of the partygoers planned to meet up afterward and continue their drinking and partying downtown. Bob and Christy were both intoxicated as they left the reception with Christy driving their minivan. Several witnesses saw her driving northbound on Six Mile Road on Mackinac Trail at 11.15 p.m. They were en route to the downtown or bar, but had apparently been arguing. She says she doesn't remember if Bob got out of the van at the Three Mile Mackinac Trail intersection or if he was in the van when she made it downtown because she was so intoxicated. One report stated that she vaguely remembered him sleeping in the van after they had an argument. It's possible that he exited the van at the Three Mile Mackinac Trail intersection, which is a rural area, and planned to walk home, which was about two to three miles away. However, he was not dressed for the weather that night, which was in the mid-40s, and was wearing black dress pants, a bright yellow polo-style shirt, and deck-style shoes. There is also the possibility that Bob rode in the van with Christy all the way downtown, and there was one sighting of him there. A man reported seeing Bob behind the downtowner bar between 11.30 p.m. and midnight, but his family is adamant that he never made it downtown, and then strangely years later, that witness recanted his sighting. Christy made it to downtown Sault Ste. Marie in about 15 to 20 minutes to an area known as Maloney's Alley, where several bars and night spots are located. Around 1 a.m., she returned home to relieve two young babysitters, and when the two girls asked where Bob was, Christy said to the effect of, I left him behind. Once the babysitters were paid and returned to their home, Christy drove drunk once again and went downtown for a second time back to Maloney's alley, leaving the kids home alone asleep. According to friends, she was laughing, dancing, and acting like nothing was wrong. Just a few hours later in the early morning hours, Christy made a panicked call to Bob's brother asking where Bob was, but he didn't know. Bob had little money and no credit cards with him at the time he went missing, and there is no evidence that he attempted to hitchhike or take a taxi cab out of the area. Authorities do not believe he left of his own accord, and his family suspects foul play was involved in his disappearance. There have been many organized searches, including scuba teams and cadaver dogs, but there hasn't been a solid clue to his whereabouts. The area around Three Mile Mackinac Trail intersection was searched, but it is a marshy, swampy area, which makes searches challenging. In the last decade, the area was torn up to create a roundabout, and no sign of Bob was located. His family often conducts searches looking for his body, but have found no clues. Investigators state that Christy has been cooperative during this entire investigation and has passed two lie detector tests. There were no large or noticeable gaps between the time when Christy and Bob left the wedding reception and when Christy arrived downtown, and she appears to have arrived in a reasonable amount of time. While some still speculate that he met with foul play and multiple people covered up the crime, it is also speculated that he may have stumbled into nearby water in a drunken state. One rumor circulating was that he was urinating on the side of the road after a fight with Christy and planning to walk home while she continued to the bars as planned. Without her knowledge at the time, he was hit and killed by a drunk driver in a car occupied by several men that he knew. Panicked, they put him in the trunk and later buried him. At the time, a new hockey arena was being constructed on the local reservation not far from Three Mile Mackinac Trail and is now called the Big Bear Arena. The concrete floor was poured a day or two after Bob disappeared, and one or more of the alleged men had access to construction equipment, and another one was actually working on the Big Bear project. Of the men, one is rumored to be Christie's brother, one killed himself within a couple years of the disappearance, and one of them later died from alcoholism. Either way, his three sons have grown up not knowing what happened to their father, and his family just wants to give him a proper burial. 26 years later, Bob's whereabouts remain unclear, and as of today, this case remains unsolved.